We're going to hear about some new bills in the Florida legislature that if passed would impact LGBTQ plus Floridians. And joining us by Zoom to talk about this are Joe Saunders, the Senior Political Director of Equality Florida, and Quinn Diaz, a Public Policy Associate with Equality Florida. So welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Joe and Quinn. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate you coming on today. So let's begin with your organization. Joe, what is Equality Florida? Well, thank you so much, Sean, for um, having us on. It's a really important time to be having this conversation. Um, Equality Florida is Florida's largest LGBTQ civil rights organization. We were founded in 1997 in response to the Defense of Marriage Act passing um, in the Florida Capitol. At that time, there were no LGBTQ voices um, from the community who were there to oppose that law. And when we were founded in response to that, it was our mission to ensure that no anti-LGBTQ laws would pass again. That was true for 23 years, and then Ron DeSantis was elected, and here we are. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of LGBTQ legislation in Florida, and then we'll get to some bills that are, are in the, the legislature this week, as soon as this week. And uh, so let's talk that about going back to 2021. Governor DeSantis signed a law that kept trans women from playing in female sports. And then the following year, he approved the Parental Rights in Education Bill that prohibits classroom discussion about gender and identity and other things. So uh, what about the, the recent legislation that has happened, as you mentioned, during the DeSantis administration? Would either one of you want to kind of uh, look, at, look back a little bit at some of the things that have happened so far? Sure. Well, I'll take a first stab at it and then, Quinn, if you... I um, want to jump in and certainly correct any of my record. Um, well, last year was a hallmark year in the worst ways for the LGBTQ community, Sean, because, um, you know, I've been doing this work with Equality Florida <clears throat> and in the LGBTQ movement for almost 20 years. And last year was the first time um, in, in my time doing work in this state where we saw such an avalanche of anti-LGBTQ bills. 22 anti-LGBTQ bills were filed in the 2023 legislative session. Um, and when the dust settled and all was said and done, the substance of 17 of them was passed into law. So there's, your, your question is a difficult one because there was quite a lot of ground covered by the far right, but just to hit some of the highlights, we saw uh, a sweeping, um, attack on the transgender community, what we call the gender affirming care ban. We can talk a little bit more about that, but effectively it uh, criminalized doctors um, and banned health care for uh, transgender young people while also limiting access to life-saving health care for transgender adults. We saw the bathroom bill pass, which uh, was uh, a sweeping mandate on public buildings, local governments, colleges, universities, um, high schools and middle schools to require um, the policing of transgender people as they entered public restrooms. Uh, we certainly saw the expansion of the don't say gay or trans law, which I think most of the public is familiar with at this point, a bill that uh, or a law that when it was first filed two years ago was supposed to just be about K through third grade. Um, and then in law saw an expansion up to eighth grade until the Board of Education fueled by our public, uh, uh, our education secretary, Manny Diaz, instituted a rule through all K through 12 grades. Um, so there have really been a sweeping number of attacks on the freedoms of LGBTQ Floridians and an and a agenda coming from Tallahassee focused on censorship and surveillance. And Equality of Florida called that a slate of hate that came out in, in about a year ago. And Quinn, do you have anything you'd like to add about uh, what Joe was saying? Yeah, uh, Joe's exactly right. After last year's legislative session, transgender Floridians found themselves crowdfunding their moves out of state, staying home to avoid using a public restroom, and desperately attempting to arrange for continued health care coverage against the backdrop of a national debate on the validity of our existence. Nationwide, there was 450 anti-LGBTQ bills that were filed, with the anti-trans initiatives seeking to ban access to health care, as we have in Florida, restrooms, 
sports, legal protections, identity documents, and even basic recognition while criminalizing supportive loved ones and healthcare providers. 70 of these bills have passed nationwide. And when you take stock of it, especially in Florida, it's very difficult to avoid the conclusion that the right's political endgame is persecution and erasure of transgender Floridians. We're seeing bills being filed. The legislative session starts Tuesday uh, for 2024, and we're just seeing this continued escalation of extremist attacks that only work to limit the freedoms of all Floridians um, through unprecedented government intrusion and censorship, the curtailing of freedoms of speech and expression, bodily autonomy and self-determination. And we're just seeing a doubling down of this commitment to further harm an already marginalized population. Transgender people make up just 1.6% of the national population. So this is an extremely small group of people. And yet the legislature's focus is not on delivering relief on any of the issues that all Floridians are crying out for. It's just on attacking this very small segment of the population. Our guests are Quinn Diaz, a public policy associate with Equality Florida, and Joe Saunders, the senior political director of Equality Florida. And we're talking about bills that have happened so far in the past legislative sessions that became law. And we will be talking later on in the interview about the new session of the Florida legislature and bills that would impact LGBTQ Floridians. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Joe mentioned a few minutes ago uh, about the Florida Board of Education. It adopted in July five new rules that targeted the LGBTQ community, community in schools. How would that impact the LGBTQ community? Well, the, uh, the, you're right, there's been a few. Um, and uh, you know some of the bills we didn't mention from last year, but um, one that centered that's important to center is the attack on diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher ed. So we've seen uh, sweeping attacks and sweeping censorship um, from Tallahassee in K through 12 public schools and in the higher ed system. Um, Quinn, I know that you followed very closely what was happening um, at the Board of Governors meetings. You wanna talk about that? Sure, so these rules that are implemented by the agency after the law is passed, We've just seen this pattern from the DeSantis administration where the rule is, ex or excuse me, the law is extremely restrictive and then the rulemaking agencies just take it so much further. So as Joe Menten mentioned, the Board of Governors is responsible for implementing the rules that govern the state university system. In um, the fall, we just saw a complete prohibition on any expenditures that would be related to social advocacy. That covers so many topics that's not exclusive to the LGBT community. Um, we're also seeing that rulemaking still in action for the State Board of Education. Their next meeting is coming up next week on the 17th in Tallahassee, where they will similarly adopt that language that the Board of Governors has already approved of. Um, it's just an all out attack on the rights and dignities of any type of minority group on a college on a college campus. Um, in K through 12 classrooms, we're seeing complete bans on instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity through eighth grade. And again, here's an example where the State Board of Education is just taking it one step further because they created a rule that was not in the original law that requires that any school sponsored event activity um, that might, they're trying to intimidate teachers from sponsoring them because if they basically don't line up perfectly with the law. Teachers can't even sponsor those groups and those clubs. That, that was not in the original law. This is the rulemaking agencies just taking this censorship agenda one step further. And perhaps a way to illustrate the some of the changes that have happened in Florida. On Sunday, the Washington Post ran a story. It was called Family Friendly Drag Queen Faces Hate and Threats in Hostile Florida. It's about Lakeland resident Jason DeShazzo, who has become a target of the far right because he performs as Mama Ashley Rose. The Post writes that neo-Nazi protesters have disrupted his shows while Christian groups have tried to shut them down entirely. He's received online death threats. So um, how does this story kind of illustrate what's happening in Florida? Well, look, I... I... I'll say this, Sean, I, I feel like um, as advocates, but also as uh, you know, a practitioner in the press, anybody out in, in, in the world who is watching what is happening, a mistake that we can make sometimes is to center the fires and not center the arsonists. 
right? And so I think it's important to pull up a little bit and, and ask ourselves, what is happening and why? Why is this happening? Well, the reality is, is that, you know, why is it that state law and the legislature and all of these different institutions are suddenly feel like they're in alignment with the same neo-Nazi groups that are protesting um, a, a drag show, right? Why, why is that happening? Well, I think it's happening because the state under Governor Ron DeSantis has been pulled dramatically to the right. And some of the guardrails, you know, I served in the Florida legislature back in 2012. And um, for years and years and years, these kinds of attacks would be laughed at. They would be marginalized. You know, people would file bills like these, but we would not see them moving. We certainly wouldn't see them be, uh, being turned into law. And I think the thing that has changed is that Ron DeSantis has um, followed his political ambitions, made the decision to yank the state to the right. He's allowed the inmates to be in charge of the asylum. And so these think tank, uh, far right think tank driven plays that we see, as Quinn mentioned, proliferating and promulgating across the country suddenly have a salience here that they haven't had before. That is what is happening. This is about the political ambitions of a of a governor fueled by hubris and super far right lawmakers who uh, historically would have been marginalized suddenly being given a microphone and being given a platform to do some really horrible things. There's been some talk that perhaps because Governor DeSantis's presidential campaign has flopped, that he might not hold as much sway in the Florida legislature. Do you think that that possibility, it might indicate that this session might not be as bad or there might not be as, as much um, of this slate of hate as you put it last year might not be quite as uh, hateful? So um, I wish that were true. I wish that's what we were seeing. But I, I think what we're seeing actually is an escalation of this agenda. Um, so, you know, the climate has certainly been set by this governor, this governor who's been willing to sow division amongst Floridians. If, if, if Governor DeSantis had his way, he would, <laughs> if Governor DeSantis had his way, I think he would have the country believing that Florida was a bastion um, of, uh, of far right conservative thought, that it was a place where, um, you know, uh, the whitewashing of history was such celebrated by a majority of people. But, you know, I don't believe that's who Florida is. Um, but I think that the, the, you know, the genie's out of the bottle now. What we're seeing already in, you know, the middle of the day tomorrow is when we'll actually know the full landscape of the legislative session. And, and what Quinn and I and the team that we work with have been living through is this avalanche of bills. So we're, we're tracking... Um, many of which we haven't fully been able to read because some of them drop and they're as many as 70 pages long. But what we're tracking so far is as many as 15 anti-LGBTQ bills that expressly attack our community. And I think it's really important to say that the majority of them expressly attack the transgender community. That at the end of the day, you know, this is a far right think tank driven play to demonize and marginalize a community that, as Quinn has already mentioned, is not very well known by the public that it's easy to spin um, conjecture and lies and misinformation about. It is an easy target for promulgating fear. And that really is the play. That's what Ron DeSantis has made possible in Florida, is far-right lawmakers playing to their own base, but signaling to the broader populace, there are people out there you should be afraid of, and we're going to create laws that protect you from them, that in effect remove freedoms, rights, um, and protections for already marginalized people. Our guests are Joe Saunders, the Senior Political Director of Equality Florida, and Quinn Diaz, a Public Policy Associate, associate with Equality Florida. And we're talking about the new session of the Florida Legislature and bills that would impact LGBTQ Floridians. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. So that does bring us to the 2024 legislative session. It begins this week. And let's look at some of the new bills that are being proposed. The first one I'd like you to talk about is HB 901, which is also called Senate Bill 1120. And that's the display of flags by governmental entities like government buildings, public schools and universities that they will not be able to, if this bill passes and becomes law, they will not be able to represent a political viewpoint on anything partisan, racial 
or relating to sexual orientation or gender or political ideological views. So for example, uh, every year I usually cover, cover the city of Gulfport raising its LGBTQ pride flag over its library each pride month. So that would ban displays of pride flags on government buildings and universities. That's right, yes. Uh, this bill would ban the use of any flag that represents a political viewpoint, including pride flags from public buildings, and is just another part of this censorship agenda. It is born largely from far-right activists who protest LGBTQ pride flags on government buildings and bans um, this bill of visibility in public spaces and classrooms for all minority groups. We saw a similar bill filed last year, um, and the sponsor got tripped up because he in the debate basically conceded that, yeah, we can still fl fly Confederate flags under the proposed bill from last session. So they're taking a different approach this year, but the goal is the same to limit visibility and um, just you know prohibit the use of LGBTQ pride flags in public spaces. And Joe, what, what do you think, uh, how, if it failed last year, is it likely to be able to go ahead this year? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think that um, so many of the guardrails are off that people should take all of these attacks very seriously, Sean. Um, I do think that this, this bill as drafted is very broad. Um, you know, and I, it's, it's, it's um, interesting to see that as they try, as the far right members of this legislature try to get to the things that they want, how often they will overplay. So for example, I, I read this um, bill and I think it includes a display of the a flag of Israel, for example. I think it includes uh, uh, displays of the Cuban flag, which here in Miami-Dade County is a really important part of civic life, you know? So, so this, it is a hyper, it is one more way of hyper flexing into a, an agenda of censorship that is designed to divide people when where I think the public really is, is they want um, they want a Florida that's anchored in inclusion, where everybody gets an identity that works for them. Everybody gets to um, exist and coexist in a way that is harmonious. So um, I think there are lots of pressures around this bill. Um, there are lots of communities impacted by this bill, which could affect its final trajectory. But I don't think any of us um, should start from the assumption that all of these bills do not have legs. And that's, we're talking again about HB 901 or SB 1120, display of flags by government entities. So Quinn or Joe, anything more to talk about that bill before we move on to a couple of the others? HB 599 would limit the use of personal pronouns. So it expands the don't say gay bill to the workplace, of what, what critics call the don't say gay law. So um, how would that impact Floridians? Well. <clears throat> I'm, I'm really glad you raised this one. I think this is one of the most dangerous bills that's been filed this session. Um, we've begun to call this don't say gay or trans at work uh, because this is an extreme escalation, again, of a law that was never about children. When we for, first um, were presented with the don't say gay or trans law, the original draft and what lawmakers told us over and over again as we pushed back was this was just about limiting the conversations in the K through uh, 12 system to third grade. And the very next year they expanded it in law to eighth grade and in rule to 12th grade. And um, this has always been what the agenda was about. It was always anchored um, in bigotry. It was always anchored in this belief that um, visibility of gay or transgender experience um, is offensive to some, and that some people's um, bigotry and homophobia and transphobia should be the center of, a co of the conversation in public life, while the rest of us need to um, be quiet. And if we're not willing to be quiet, we should leave the state. So the don't say gay or trans at work law, HB 599, uh, it expressly regulates how charities and certain private businesses and human service organizations can train employees on LGBTQ issues um, it expressly regulates whether or not they can conduct what is, quote, LGBTQ related activities, whatever that means. Um, and it even regulates how employees can speak to each other. Quinn, what else about this bill do you think is important to highlight? 
Yeah, Joe's exactly right. Uh, this is a very concerning bill. And even under this bill, the state would attempt to withhold contracts from private businesses that don't rubber stamp the position that trans people do not exist. And we've gone through the state contracts, and there's many corporations that would be impacted, 26 of which are, you know, earning perfect scores on the human rights campaign's equality index. Um, the government shouldn't ban private businesses from putting into place cultural competency or sexual harassment trainings that include LGBTQ issues. And it has a ludicrous Bible or biology or religious exemption that just creates a, you know, whole host of issues uh, that threatens employee safety at work by allowing employees to openly disregard workplace policies and protections. That one is really important, Sean. Can I just put a, um, a highlight on that? So, you know, again, this is a, an example of a very long uh, piece of legislation that what the press um, and the public zeroed in on first um, was the uh, was the provisions related to pronouns, which I know that you mentioned, which, again, are the our government inserting itself, the state inserting itself into the practices of private businesses and nonprofits to regulate how employees can or cannot talk to each other, which for me is mind blowing. But this provision around um, uh, the sweeping license to discriminate that's built into this bill is a ticking time bomb. Uh, it is broad in the way that it's drafted and it effectively says that, that employees can invoke um, a sincerely held religious belief as a get out of jail free card for any policy um, or protection offered by their employer. Think about the implications that that would have on all private business in the state. This is um, a sweeping piece of legislation uh, that we find to be one of the most dangerous filed. You mentioned how a, a, an employee could have a religious exemption, but I think there's also, uh, is there a biology based beliefs exemption? And what does that even mean? Your guess is as good as ours. <laughs> Yeah, the state is definitely attempting to impose sex-based stereotypes to compel conformity for its normative vision of sex roles, rolling back the clock on all gender equity. And it's not lost on us that the same administration that denies basic science in the efficacy of vaccines are now biological experts. Sean, can I just make one other point on this one too, which is, uh, you know, I I'll keep bringing us back to the same theme, which is, you know, it it's helpful to look at the fires, but it's more helpful to look at who the arsons are. So um, a few years ago, the Supreme Court ruled in a case that the, the United States Supreme Court ruled in a case um, called Bostock v. Clayton County that discrimination on the basis of sex includes uh, is inclusive of, is encompassing of discrimination against the transgender community. The highest court in the land, a Republican conservative court, acknowledged the existence of transgender people and understood that under the uh, U.S. Civil Rights Act, transgender people deserved protection when it came to employment. Now, states across the country have inferred that to believe that transgender people, including Florida, um, also are afforded protections in housing and in public spaces, that in civil rights law, they rec effectively recognize the existence of transgender people and the fact that transgender people in the United States experience discrimination sometimes. So when we talk about looking at the forest for the trees in these sweeping slates of bills, I think what we also see is an attempt to set up tension with these these precedences established in federal court as high as the United States Supreme Court. The, the legislature uh, at the bequest of the, this governor who has chosen to, ex to expand his political influence and career on the backs of marginalized communities like the transgender community are trying to erode these protections that are afforded to them through federal law and through Supreme Court precedents. That, that is also what I think this is about. I think they are in a bunch of different bills and a bunch of different vehicles and in a bunch of different ways, setting up attention to try to erode protections that the transgender community and the LGBTQ community has already won. And that tension could end up leading to court challenges and, and it, it being challenged all up to superior courts, including the Supreme Court. Absolutely. I mean, I think we see that most expressly this year in the trans erasure law, which I expect we might talk about soon. This is another sweeping piece of legislation. So again, you know, 
it, last year we heard, oh, well, this is just about health care. This is just, you know, a, the gender affirming care ban is just about transgender young people and the decisions that their parents make in alignment with their doctors about the health care that they received. And yet this year we see a sweeping piece of uh, legislation filed by the uh, by Representative Black, who is the chair of the Republican Party of Duval County, so one of the most transphobic and one of the most partisan members of the legislature, introducing a bill that attacks transgender people in, in basically every other facet of public life, right? A, a bill that tries to take away driver's licenses from transgender adults, tries to take away their ID cards. Um, and also baked into here into that bill is an attempt to change the definitions and structure of the Florida Civil Rights Act so that it no longer includes, by virtue of that Supreme Court case we just talked about, Bostock v. Clayton County, protections for the transgender community, effectively trying to rewrite state law to block access to trans for transgender people to the protections afforded by the United States Supreme Court. Now, we don't think that works. <laughs> we think that's blatantly unconstitutional. We don't think state law can even be used to do that, but it's, it is in the attempt that I think we see what the real strategy here is. Our guests are Joe Saunders, the Senior Political Director of Equality Florida, and Quinn Diaz, a Public Policy Associate with Equality Florida. We're talking about the new session of the Florida Legislature and bills that would impact the LGBTQ community in Florida. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. That bill that Joe was talking about a second ago is called HB 1233, again um, filed last week by Dean Black, a Republican representative from North Florida. And according to tweets by Carlos Guillermo Smith, it, he calls it a sweeping new assault on the rights and dignity of transgender Floridians that seek to deny their legal existence, create new barriers to medically necessary care, and put anti-LGBTQ mandates on private insurance companies. How do, where do the private insurance companies fit in here? It's wild. <laughs> the the um the hubris of this legislation. Quinn, let me take a stab at that question, but please back me up with whatever I might miss. But, you know, um, there are a number of ways that this legislation inserts itself into the practices of private insurance providers in the state. Um, the, the most egregious to me is the way that it requires all insurance policies in the state to pay for the debunked practice of conversion therapy. All right. So the practice of um, of a fake therapist or fake mental health provider, because at this point in in the public discourse, no legitimate one uh, is offering this practice. But it requires health insurance companies like Florida Blue um, or Aetna to pay for this debunked practice. So so this is where we are in 2024 in Florida. This legislature is willing to insert itself and mandate that insurance companies pay for the debunk practice of conversion ther therapy, but is not willing, is not willing as a legislature to require that insurance companies lower your homeowner ins homeowner's insurance premiums or car insurance premiums. That is the extremism of this legislature in 2024. And in addition to the requirement to cover conversion therapy, this bill would generally create new barriers to medically necessary life-saving care by requiring that health insurers that do offer gender-affirming care offer it at a higher cost. So just increasing uh, the prohibitiveness in access to gender-affirming care, which based on last year's law, is already very difficult to um, access even for adults. 80% of folks who used to receive their care through nurse practitioners now need to find somewhere else to get it. And a few minutes ago, Joe mentioned that it would create barriers for transgender Floridians to getting driver's licenses and other accurate IDs. How would it do that? Sure. So this would prohibit the legal recognition for trans Floridians by denying access to accurate licenses and other IDs by requiring those state issued ID cards to reflect someone's sex assigned at birth. Uh, there would be no way to update your sex on your driver's license and everyone in the state would actually be required upon renewal or seeking for the very first time their driver's license to sign a sex affidavit confirming that the sex on your application for your license matches your original birth certificate. Now, attempts like this to deny trans folks access to um, 
accurate identification is very dangerous. Um, it also forces them to make the impossible choice between full participation in public society and having basic human rights. For a lot of people, this could entirely dissuade them from obtaining Florida's driver's license and in a dangerous way might contradict uh, identity documents that they already hold from, let's say, the federal government, passports, for instance, which you can update and which might reflect a different gender. And it does this, it's probably helpful to say, Sean, it does this by anchoring um, all, all references in this law to, to what is designated on a person's birth certificate at the time of birth, right? So, you know, there are um, many transgender Floridians who are members of Equality Florida, who are part of our world and our network, who have these documents updated 20, 30 years ago. But what Representative Black's bill would require is um, a, a pledge via affidavit that the information that you're providing the DMV um, is reflective of what your birth certificate said maybe 50 years ago. And so if you if you misrepresent that information under threat of affidavit, affidavit the state now has legal rights to take action against you. Um, and if you are are not willing to lie, then you are forced to to update all of your documents to a gender that you were assigned at birth that you don't live to every single day in your life. And the possibility of this revoking the, the licenses of, that have already been given from uh, two transgender Floridians in the state is very real. So in, in every way, when we say that, that this is the trans erasure bill, this is intended to, um, it is designed to um, dismiss the very existence of transgender people uh, in, in so many different areas of law. It is rewriting the statutes to make the assertion, to, to infuse this ideological belief that transgender people don't exist, and if they um, insist on existing, that they should leave, right? That they are not welcome in Florida. Um, and we think that is so very dangerous for so many reasons. Our guests are Joe Saunders, the Senior Political Director of Equality Florida, and Quinn Diaz, a Public Policy Associate with Equality Florida. We're talking about the new session of the Florida Legislature and bills that would impact LGBTQ Floridians. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. The bill that we're talking about right now is called HB 1233. They're calling it the Trans Erasure Law. One part of the bill has to do with data tracking and surveillance of transgender Floridians. Is that right? That's right. Yes, this bill would increase state sponsored surveillance and government intrusion by requiring school districts and state agencies to collect data that necessarily outs transgender Floridians, which would have numerous implications for accurately tracking, let's say, hate, cr hate crimes against transgender people. Um, but it would also, you know, create a lot of issues within privacy and protection against further political targeting and persecution. And it and it um it is a mandate on all Floridians, Sean. This is the other important thing to say. This is the again the hubris of this legislature. Um, it requires all of these agencies to collect expressly. It's an, it's another example of how the this legislature will create law that is vague by design, with no um, thought about what implementation would really mean, about how agencies are supposed to adapt, about what the budget implications for that would be. But it is a a, a sweeping play of surveillance on all Floridians, because it requires that all Floridians now be asked what their sex um, assigned at birth was, what the, what the sex on their um, birth certificate is for agencies that might not even collect that information. So it, it not only it is intended to be this sweeping attack on um, a very small part of our community, but it will have implications and effect on the agencies that all of us inter, inter, uh, act with and interrelate with every day. Transgender Floridians, like other uh, people, have protections in housing, employment, and public spaces. But if this bill becomes law, how might that change? Well, I think this goes back to the, um, the discussion we've been having around um, the far right. And, and again, this is happening in multiple states. So I think it's important for your listeners to understand this is not just a Florida strategy. This is the strategy of the far right that has been given free reign in our state thanks to our governor. Um, but I, you know, the the, uh, the protections you've just referenced come from 
Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court precedents. And so I think what's really happening here is a desire to create tension there. The, the state of Florida and this legislature don't get to decide whether or not transgender people are protected in employment and housing. That comes from the United States um, federal law, the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which has been interpreted by the United States Supreme Court to include protections for our community. Now, that the natural progression is that those protections and that precedence and that understanding of law is inferred into the Florida Civil Rights Act. But what, what Representative Black is attempting to do here is to change the Florida Civil Rights Act to expressly exclude the transgender community. Um, that creates a tension that would need to be uh, mitigated and figured out through the courts. Um, we think it is a sort of gross attempt to erase the experiences um, and rights of transgender Floridians, but it's also a play that we don't think would work. Well, earlier in the interview, you mentioned that there are about 15 bills or so that are that might take away the liberties of Floridians who are in the LGBTQ plus community. We've talked about three of them so far. Are there any others that our audience should know about? Quinn, what did we miss? Um, well, there is this one employment conditions preemption bill that we're monitoring closely that seeks to preempt local governments from regulating certain types of employment issues and practices that could jeopardize a number of local employment ordinances that provide benefits and protections for the LGBT community that are currently working well throughout the state. Uh, so we're monitoring that. There's... Um, a lot of chatter in the juvenile justice space about making that same switch from uh, gender to sex so that folks would be classified by their sex assigned at birth. There is a single student uh, organization bill, which basically creates a single sex student organization bill of rights. Uh, this is in response to discipline that was handed down to a Wyoming sorority that rejected a trans woman's membership based exclusively on her transgender status. So it would protect those single sex student organizations from any type of administrative discipline at their schools. There is an expansion of the so-called stop woke prohibitions on the teaching of racism, sexism, oppression, and privilege to teachers during their training period through the State Board of Education. And again, uh, bill filing deadline isn't until Tuesday midday, so we have still some time for things to trickle down. So those are just some of what we're monitoring. Um, hopefully, you know, the list won't grow too long. And many of those bills, Sean, have just dropped. You know, this is the nature of the of the legislative session here in Florida, as I know you know. Um, you know, things are sort of cooked, often not by the lawmakers filing them, and then strategically dropped into the legislative process just a few days before the bill filing deadline. So some of these bills, the juvenile justice bill, for example, that Quinn mentioned is a is a 70 page bill um, that at its first reading, you might not even think has implications for the LGBTQ community, but because of where this legislature is because of the the extreme anti-LGBTQ, anti-transgender ideology that is, you know, promulgating, permeating this the conservative supermajorities that control both chambers. Right now, it, you know, it takes um, sometimes you got to spelunk through the language to to figure out that this really is an egregious attack. So we're as a you know, Equality Florida tries to be the team um, that leads the LGBTQ community and our movement through the policy analysis. We're still processing a lot of this, but um, I don't expect this is the the end to the bills that will drop. I think we'll see more between now and tomorrow, and and then we'll know where we are. And Joe, you uh, had you mentioned that the Republicans have super majorities in both chambers, but Democrats who are in the super minority in both chambers are still are also filing bills of their own. For example, Democratic Senator Tracy Davis filed Bill SB 1414 on education that she's calling the Freedom to Learn Act. And um, among other things in this bill that uh, would require instruction in LGBTQ history in public schools. So, you know, I don't know um, how how much of a long shot most Democratic bills are to pass, but um, do, what do you what can you say about this bill and what it would mean for um, the learning of LGBTQ history by our students? I'm really glad that you've taken us here because um, there are there really are two bills, a package of bills that have been introduced by um, 
by lawmakers this year that we've we've helped to shape and provided some thoughts and analysis to um, the Freedom to Learn Act introduced by Senator Tracy Davis um, and Representative Michelle Rayner and the Healthcare Freedom Act introduced by Representative Ana Escamani and Senator Chevron Jones. Um, and I'm sure we can talk about both individually, but you know, as a package, th this these are bills that we believe speak to where Floridians really are. That, you know, uh, Floridians believe in, um, uh, they, they don't believe in, in, in an agenda of censorship and surveillance. And so when we say, when we talk of, as a state about the free state of Florida, we think these two bills is what that means. You know, the Freedom to Learn Act, as it's drafted, allows um, age and development mentally appropriate K through 12 instruction in our K through 12 public schools on topics that include gender identity and sexual orientation age and developmentally appropriate instruction. Um, it allows for the, uh, um, permits the use of affirming titles. Um, if you, especially if a parent asserts it, if a parent asserts that they expect their transgender child to be respected and treated with dignity and referred to um, as their gender identity, this allows for that. It ensures that schools don't forcibly out students when it could endanger their safety. We we wish and hope that every home is safe, but we also know um, uh, that the Department of Children and Families and our child welfare system is some of the most underfunded and most in need. Sometimes it's not safe for a, um, a school district or a teacher to out an LGBTQ student if the home environment isn't ready for it. So this creates space for that. Um, Quinn, what else? The Freedom to Learn Act is a large bill that covers a lot of ground. What did I miss? Yeah, so we're repealing, um, as Joe mentioned, some of the provisions of Don't Say LGBTQ, but we're also uh, promoting truth in teaching and safeguarding access to books. So we're narrowing who can submit an objection to instructional material. Right now, it stands that anyone in any county can, but this would narrow that to just the parent of a child who's in a district within that school district, or excuse me, a school within that school district. Um, Again, it allows for the teaching of sexual orientation and gender identity topics. And we talked earlier about how uh, DEI initiatives on college campuses were being cur curtailed. Well, this would actually um, encourage those universities and state colleges to financially support DEI programming and campus activities and permit instruction about discrimination in general education core classes, which is currently prohibited. Well, any last thoughts as we wrap up? Well, I want to thank you, Sean, for giving us um, this platform. And I, um, you know, your station and your work is always valuable as we head into the legislative session season. You know, I, I do think this conversation can feel heavy. It can feel like there is a lot, um, a lot of bad that's coming. Um, and that's true. But I also hope that folks um, recognize the absolute necessity of being involved in this process right now. You know, there were 22 anti-LGBTQ bills that were filed in the legislative session season in 2023. Um, many of them died. Um, and of the ones that were passed, you know, I, 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 the language that I shared at the top of our time together was that um, many were consolidated, uh, seven, the substance of 17 were consolidated in, into effectively eight vehicles that were signed into law. And lots of provisions were changed as a result of that. You know, that pressure that comes from people calling their state lawmakers, calling their state senators and state representatives, making their way to Tallahassee. If you can and you have the um, the ability to come join Equality Florida uh, in the Florida Capitol on Tuesday of uh, next week, we launched the Pride at the Capitol program. Um, last year, we had 300 Floridians from across the state join us to meet with their lawmakers. Those moments really, really matter. And if you can't make it to Tallahassee, you can join Equality Florida's ad advocacy programs at equalityflorida.org and learn more about how you can get involved online, how you can get involved in your local community. But those advocacy moments are how we stop bad things from happening and build a Florida where all of us are truly free, truly safe, and all of us are welcome. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us on Tuesday Cafe, Joe and Quinn. Thank you, Sean. Thanks so much, Sean. 
Joe Saunders is the Senior Political Director of Equality Florida, and Quinn Diaz is a Public Policy Associate with Equality Florida. We've been speaking about the new session of the Florida Legislature and bills that would impact LGBTQ Floridians here on Tuesday Cafe, broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa.